Welcome to our new study in the book of Revelation. Revelation speaks to our world today. Everyone knows our world is rapidly changing. Come and see how God already knew about it. You will discover it's easier to understand than you thought. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember you, Bonnie. The pace of life just gets so out of hand. I try my best, but it's just never good enough. I'm reminded of how much I need to know. You are for me, you're not against me. You are with me, I'm not alone. Through all the darkest times and brightest days, I know some things will always stay the same. We'd like to welcome you to a brand new series, in fact, a new program uh, that's going to be on uh, hopefully every Sunday. And so we are going to welcome you first of all, but then we want to invite you to come back each week. Uh, we are going to take you on a journey on Sunday mornings through the book of Revelation. And the way we're going to approach this is, uh, first of all, we're going to begin with uh, some of Sherry's photographs. So, Sherry, if you would put that on, I want you to get a, just a look at this gorgeous moose. Uh, here she is right there, and uh, she is right at the foot of the Tetons there. And don't miss that little duck in the foreground. It almost looks like a couple of friends there in the pond. Uh, Sherry just has fabulous photographs that we're going to share with you every week. So thank you, Sherry, for your gift and what you bring to us. Now, let me kind of explain to you how we are going to approach the book of Revelation. So we titled it Revelation Now, and what we mean by that is simply that Revelation is a contemporary book in the moment. It doesn't mean that it doesn't speak about the past, it doesn't mean it doesn't speak about the future, but we want to talk about what it has to say today to you and to me. It has a message. Then we also have a subtitle that will be on each program called God Shares His Thoughts With Us. Now I want you to think about this. John is receiving what he is writing as the thoughts of God, and he's putting them into his own words, trying to explain to you what he has seen. And that'll be in the text. You will see that more clearly in just a moment. So we're going to go through about the first 10 verses of Revelation chapter 1 today. This is basically an introduction. So let's jump right in. Uh, if you got a letter from your grandfather... Would you start in the middle of the letter, or would you start with the first sentence? Maybe you'd read the last page. I don't know. We will start, because this is a letter from God, with chapter 1, verse 1, and then we're going to go verse by verse to the end of the letter. Remember, this was written as a letter to seven churches in Asia. That is called looking at the context of each verse. Now, I'm just going to confess, there's going to be some times we're going to take and some of the discussion we'll group together for you, but we are going to cover, hopefully, every verse the best we can in the book of Revelation for you. Now, the chapter 1 sets the tone for the entire book. It kind of lays out everything God wants you to know about what He's up to. It's His last message of hope for this planet and His plan to return to complete the gospel. It's about your life of grace in Him, the key points to watch for, Faith in action and worship. This entire book challenges you to answer one question. Who do you worship? And you have a choice between these beasts and the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth. Now, the book of Revelation, if this will help you kind of understand it a bit more, it's a book about contrast. God sets things against each other to make them stand out more clearly. So we have the forces of God. That's the Lamb, the redeemed, a virgin. We have New Jerusalem, the story of salvation, the sea of glass, and the seal of God. But God also reveals Satan's forces. For the Lamb, the contrast is there's the beasts that fulfill Satan's will. Contrast to the redeemed or the wicked. Contrast to the virgin is a harlot. We'll look at her carefully in several chapters. There is the virgin that is that beautiful church. Uh, I hope you enjoy the painting of that. There's just a spectacular picture. You have the New Jerusalem, 
at the end of the book, but you have Babylon the Great, that great city in chapter 17 and 18. You have salvation and judgment. Everybody's interested in that. You have that sea of glass. The contrast is a lake of fire. Then you have the seal of God versus the mark of the beast. You know, that's just kind of a really great overview and introduction to the book. So let's begin with chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show, gave him to show his bond servants. The word revelation is a word that means an unveiling or an unfolding. Here, it is the unfolding of the person Jesus Christ, the resurrected, ascended, and now coming king. The book of Revelation picks up where the gospel leaves off. Now, let's go to chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, I should invite you, if you have your Bible in a different translation, you might enjoy just taking your Bible and following along if you have time, or maybe you just want to enjoy listening. So here's verse 2, the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. And this is what I told you earlier. Here's John receiving these thoughts from God, and then he's going to take and take these beautiful thoughts in his head and write them down and record them for us as what he witnessed or his testimony, okay? So here's verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it. Now listen carefully. Just hearing the book gives you a blessing. Not even understanding it. Just reading the book gives you a blessing. And if you respond and integrate what the book says into your life, the things that are written in it, there is a blessing. In other words, God has structured this book through inspiration that if you hear it, if you read it, if you apply it, any one of those three gifts you a blessing from God in your life. But can you imagine if you put all three of them together? That is a rich, full life in Christ. Isn't that really beautiful? I think that's one of my favorite verses in the book of Revelation, is here is a promise from God to bless you for the time you invest just in this book. So now we go to verse 4. It says, To John, the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him, and you notice sometimes I highlight these slides, so notice carefully, who is and who was and who is to come. So who is is present, who was is in the past, who is to come is in the future. So understand this is telling you that God is past, present, and future all at the same time, but there's more. Uh, occasionally I'm going to insert a quote from a commentary. Uh, this one is from Barnes Notes, and uh, he wrote this well over 100 years ago. So listen to what he has to say about verse 4. He says this, what he, that is God, was in past times, he is now, and what he is now, he will always be, in other words, in the future. Continuing that quote, the fact that God remains always unchangeably the same is the sole reason why his church is safe, or why any individual member of it is kept and saved. I, I just thought that summed up that verse so beautifully. And it's really great when people can do it so much better than I can. So that I hope you enjoyed that. Continuing on, it says in verse 4, from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, seven is always a number where God's involved. Or he is in control of the events. events. So the seven spirits are God's spirit. Or consider this, the Holy Spirit doing the work of the Father and the Son. So as we pause right here in verse 4, this is like a great, you've been introduced to God the Father, to his son Jesus Christ, and now to the seven Holy Spirits which are before his throne. Those, that's just like you have just met the whole Trinity, and, and maybe it's a surprise for you to know that there are seven spirits in the very presence of God's throne to do his work in the universe. And I think, I think you'll enjoy just pondering that reality. Now in verse 5 it says, and from 
Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. Um, if you were going to go into court and someone was going to testify, would you want them to be faithful to the truth? Jesus is the one who in the heavenly courts is a faithful witness on your behalf. Don't ever forget that. Notice John, the Gospel of John now, chapter 18, verse 37. Jesus says, For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Isn't that amazing? Now in verse 5 it says he's the firstborn from the dead. That's a little more complicated, okay? So I'm going to go to Paul's letter in 1 Corinthians 15. For as in Adam all die, so also all in Christ will be made alive. So if he is for the firstborn of the dead, then it is his resurrection that allows him to make all of us alive in Christ. So he is the firstborn of the dead and resurrected to give us life. Now notice Galatians 4, 4 and 5. When the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as sons, and that includes daughters, just so you know. To be born under the law means that Jesus came born of a woman condemned to death. That's what under the law means in the New Testament. Born under condemnation. Continuing on now with Revelation 1.5, it says, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So, politics can be so bizarre sometimes, but please never forget Revelation 1.5, that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. World leaders are going to do crazy stuff, folks. But notice Revelation 19.16, where it describes Christ's coming. It says, his, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. He is the king of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. Jesus is aware of everything and all the crazy things going on in our world. Don't forget that. That's like the best news in the whole world. Leaders come and go. But Jesus is there forever, and Jesus is always there as a faithful witness on your behalf. No matter what happens in this world, our confidence and hope is not in men. It is in this person who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Isn't that amazing, the ruler of the kings of the earth? And then verse 5 says, to him who loves us. I want you to notice here in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, think of it another way. He didn't wait for you to get your life in order and get your ducks in a row and get all the problems out of your life just so you can call on his name. Jesus chose to act in concert with his Father on behalf of all of humanity while we were in the midst of our failure. Our behavior did not inspire Christ to do something. His love is demonstrated that he acted while we were still sinners. He didn't act when we got everything together. You can come to Christ anytime, 24 seven, any place, anywhere, anytime. I wanna read this verse to you again. God demonstrates his own Agape love, that's what that word means. Unconditional love for us in this. While we were still missing the point, while we were still failures, Christ died for us. Paid in full the penalty, if you would, for the failure of the sins of all humanity. Everybody on the planet, by the way. We'll talk about that more later. Isn't that just amazing? In verse 5, it continues, and released us from our sins by his blood. Um, just let that sink in for just a moment. It says that he has already released us from our sins by his blood, already a done thing, already an accomplished thing. I mean, this book is so absolutely incredible. I want you to think about your life for just a moment. 
I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's going on in it. But what I'm reading to you right now, what I am telling to you right now, this very moment, is that Jesus has already released us from our sins by his blood. It's already been done. It's not something we're waiting for him to do. My challenge to you is, have you accepted the release? I don't, I don't know if you're struggling with addiction. I don't know if you're struggling with anger or whatever. It doesn't matter. God is telling you in chapter 1, verse 5 of the book of Revelation, that you have been released from your sins. Isn't that just profound? I mean, where else can you read this in the entire Bible that this is actually a done deal? That's why I say it's a continuation of the gospel. It picks up where the gospels ended. So, here's a text that you're familiar with, many of you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, eternal life, to live forever. So, if he's released us from our sins, we're released by believing in him that he has accomplished this very thing for our life, and that he is going to apply that victory into our lives every moment of every day. That's good news, isn't it? Here's another one, Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, that's not talking about whether or not somebody you know doesn't like you, condemns you. That is talking about divine condemnation. You see, if you've been released from your sins, there is no condemnation from God directed towards you if you are in Christ Jesus. So the book of Revelation is trying to tell you today the good news is, are you accepting the release? Are you accepting the freedom from condemnation? Are you accepting Christ's gift of eternal life to you? It's an amazing book. I, I tried telling you at the beginning, there's just, it's just an unbelievably good news book all the way through. So if you went no further than this passage, and you accepted Jesus' blood as being able to release you, Right now, from your sin, you do realize your life would never be the same, right? And he has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Not only did he release you, but he's already got a position for you in his household to be part of his kingdom and to be a minister in the household of God. That's what the text says. That's already present truth. Peter puts it this way, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people from God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, one of my favorite unspoken doctrines of the Christian church is that every member of the church is already a minister. Every man, woman, and child is already a minister in the household of God. That's what Peter says, you're a chosen race, that's all of you men, women, and children, a royal priesthood, that's all of you, a holy nation, that's all of you, a people, that's all of you for God's own possession that you may make proclamation of the excellencies. That's pretty profound, isn't it? That is pretty profound. Verse 7, it says, And behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be, and here he gives you a choice. Are you going to welcome the return of Christ? Or are you going to be part of those who mourn and grieve at his coming? That's a profound moment, isn't it? That is a profound moment. Where will you stand as one who has been set free in Christ? Revelation 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha, I am the Omega, says the Lord God. And we already covered the who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. 
that the alpha and the omega is actually profoundly simple. Okay? Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. That all of those letters in between are what it takes to describe the reality and the truth of who God the Father, His Son, and the Holy Spirit are. To describe everything of who the person that is, was, and is to come, the Almighty. You see, Jesus is the beginning and the completion of our salvation history as well. It is by faith alone in Christ, he writes a new history for us about himself and how he has saved you. But he is the author and finisher in the book of Hebrews of your history. You want a new history written for you? Jesus is the one who is the Alpha and the Omega. He, can t he holds possession, if you would, of all the letters in between. And he is the one writing in the heavenly realm the truth, his truth, his testimony of who you are. And I think that's awesome. Absolutely awesome. So as we have gone through this story today, we've hit some pretty intense stuff, haven't we? Let me just kind of review a few things for you. Okay, so who is this person, Jesus? Well, he bears witness to the truth. He is the firstborn of all those who are resurrected. He is the one who loves us unconditionally with his agape love. He's released us from our sins by his blood already as a present truth, as a reality. Are you a willing recipient of that? He loved the world enough that he was willing to give his life for us. He has set you free from divine condemnation. You know, if there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, I have to ask you a question. Very personal one. Is it right for you to condemn yourself now? Because sometimes the person who beats us up the most isn't other people, it's usually ourselves. Our self-talk, our self-criticism. But now add this reality that in Christ there is no condemnation for you. Just tuck that away and let that become part of your reality. That you are free from self-condemnation. Isn't that amazing? Now, I find this intriguing. What do you want to do about your ministry? If he's made you to be a kingdom and priest so that you can serve the Father and heaven and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you want to talk about your ministry? You are called. Every person in the church and out of the church has an invitation to become part of the kingdom and a minister in the household of God. When was the last time you really thought about your ministry and who you were called to? The fact that you are part of this royal priesthood, this chosen race, a holy nation. You're a people of God's own possession. But kind of just let that resonate internally with you for a few minutes. Tell me what you think that means. How does that affect how you see people tomorrow morning when you wake up? Notice in the letter that we are reading that in chapter 1, here he says, look, he's coming with the clouds of heaven and everyone on this earth is going to see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth. So I, I just need you to take a moment and take a deep breath now and say, okay. In this letter, he tells us right away he cannot wait to come back. And it's going to be pretty spectacular. It says every eye is going to see him. You know, we've got a couple of amazing telescopes out there, and if he comes across this universe, uh, you know, if you've been following some of the spectacular things that are being viewed in the telescopes, I just want to say God's arrival is going to be grand and spectacular. Everyone is going to see him. It's just unavoidable on this planet right now. Are you going to be welcoming him when he comes? And he is the beginning and ending. He is everything in your redemption. He is past, present, and he is your future as well. 
the beginning of a new history in Jesus Christ today, right now. That's awesome. I was listening to a program on the radio the other day and a young woman was sharing her testimony of how her life just had total failure. And she says, you know, and I, I'm now starting brand new and she's just writing all brand new Christian gospel songs right now. She just has a whole new history she's experiencing and being written right now in Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that just a wonderful thing to contemplate? That can be your life and mine in Christ today. What is it that Jesus is writing about your history for you? Just ponder those things. Just let them resonate. I would encourage you to go back and reread this one more time. Just take a deep breath. We've, we've just gone through uh, eight verses, and I thought I was going to get you to 10, but we're only going to get to eight today. So we're going to have to start with nine and 10 next week, and I hope you really join us for that. Because we're going to have fun. We're going to take this book through carefully in the way it's written so you have a theme that just unfolds as this beautiful, beautiful thing in your life. I hope you enjoyed our presentation. As we close out today, um, here, Sherry, because uh, she just has those incredible moments, she's going to close out with a spectacular picture of the Tetons. And I hope you'll enjoy that. Um, it has its own weather system there, you know. It's just right up against the border of Idaho. And Sherry's pictures, by the way, all come from the Northwest. And she's going to bring us some spectacular things in nature. And uh, from the West Coast inward, uh, all the way into Wyoming, uh, occasionally even further. Blessings now. I am so glad you joined us today. I really look forward to next week. Take care. Thank you for watching today. Our email address is ScreamingRockMinistries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho, 83303.